by making up the floor of the oral cavity. So you can see with our mid-sagittal section through, you know, through the head here, obviously the mouth is closed, right? But you can see, again, that anterior boundary of the lips, uh, lateral boundary, you can't see so well uh, with the mid-sagittal section. Um, you know, the, the floor, again, <coughs> occupied by, by the tongue. Uh, and then the roof, all right? The roof of the oral cavity, essentially, all right? Uh, the maxillary bones and the palatine bones. Right, the maxillary and the palatine bone that really constitutes what we consider to be the hard palate. Uh, and then you can run a, your tongue along the surface of, or along the roof, if you will, of your mouth, and you can kind of feel where you go from that hard, all right, kind of surface where the maxillary and palatine bones are to that softer, kind of soft palate, as it's referred. You can kind of feel that spot where it kind of falls off the hard palate to the soft palate. And then at the very back of the oral cavity, essentially guarding the opening, okay, uh, to the pharynx, all right, is this little dangly piece here called the, called the uvula, all right, uh, called the uvula, okay? And so that's where ingestion occurs, right? You take a bite of your tasty cake, you might take a bite of your cheesecake, you introduce it into the oral cavity. Now, from a histology, right, from a histology standpoint, Um, or somebody stole them quickly while we're right on board. Uh, from a <laughs> histology standpoint, uh, we're talking about a uh, non keratinized, all right, stratified. Really? <laughs> I'll leave it on the board for you. All right, a non keratinized, stratified squamous epithelium. What is? What did you say? non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. You really can't write not no. even a tiny bit bigger. <laughs> like I really can't write all fit. Right. So oral cavity, right? So this is where again ingestion is occurring from a histology standpoint. It's an epithelium that is going to protect, if you will, um, the oral cavity from you know scrapes and the mechanical stresses of that food being moved within the oral cavity back and forth. All right, et cetera, et cetera. Now, uh, one of the other things that we'll talk about, although I don't think we, I don't think I'm talking about it so much today, other than just to mention it quickly. I got some more. All right, um, our salivary glands. You have three pairs of salivary glands. All right. Uh, you have the parotid salivary glands, which are the most significant in terms of the size of the gland. Right. You have the parotid salivary glands. You have a sublingual salivary gland, all right, so inferior to the tongue, right, the sublingual salivary gland, and then the submandibular, right, the mandible removable, right, portion of the jaw, right, submandibular salivary gland. Collectively, right, those three pairs of salivary glands generate for you roughly, roughly, two liters of saliva a day. Mm. Man, now, is that, you're impressive. I mean, think about it. Walk down the grocery store aisle the next time, walk down the soda aisle, look up and look at all those two liter bottles of soda sitting up there, and just think to yourself, I fill up one of those bad boys daily. All right, just about with saliva, spit. That's pretty impressive, all right? All right, so they generate lots of saliva. We'll talk more about the composition of saliva, contribution by the different glands, all right, because saliva is a little bit more viscous or thicker than water. All right, there's some mucin or mucus, if you will, that increases the viscosity of saliva, but it helps to coat the food, right? Helps to make it slippery, right? So that it moves along the pharynx down to the esophagus and then ultimately down to the stomach a little bit more effectively, okay? And easily, I should say. All right, so ingestion begins in the oral cavity. All sorts of things happen in the oral cavity. Obviously, you have gustatory cells or you know cells on the surface of the tongue that contribute to your perception of taste, how the food tastes. All right, uh, certainly olfaction, uh, you know, your taste is enhanced by, you know, your ability to smell, uh, smell your food, you know, texture, all that kind of good stuff. Um, and then once you've taken a bite of food and you've chewed it up, right, mastication again, and all of this will be discussed more extensively when we get there. Um, once you've gone ahead and chewed it up, you're going to force that bite of food, what we call a bolus now, all right, just a little kind of uh, mass of, you know, kind of a moist mass of food, your bolus of food, you're going to use your tongue and you're going to force that back into what we call the oropharynx, all right, the oropharynx. Now, 
the pharynx, I think when we talked about the uh, respiratory system, I think I mentioned there's three regions, right? There's a nasopharynx, an oral, and an olaryngopharynx. So from the oral cavity, we're gonna go into the oropharynx, all right, and the laryngeal, uh, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx, okay? And yes, while these specific regions of the uh, pharynx are certainly, again, shared with the respiratory system from a histology standpoint, all right, it needs to be protective against mechanical stresses, right? Food being forced along the throat, right? Being forced by muscular contraction along that pharynx down towards, all right, down towards the esophagus. So from the oral cavity, food is gonna get moved, all right, voluntarily as part of swallowing, right? Is gonna get moved back into the pharynx and then is gonna begin its movement essentially down towards, uh, down towards the stomach. <coughs> Uh, again, you know, your non peritonized stratified squamous. And there'll be some slides that we look at in the future related to histology of the digestive tract. Okay. So oropharynx and laryngopharynx. Now, nasopharynx, nah, not usually right uh, associated with, not usually associated with uh, uh, good eating. Okay, um, I'm sure at some point somebody made you giggle or laugh while you're drinking something and you squirted whatever that something was out your nose, right? Because the reality is the pharynx, all regions of the pharynx are ultimately connected. Um, well, I was in uh, I was in band when I was in well, well from the time I was little, I took you know piano lessons and then uh, got into elementary school. I started playing the trumpet and I was in band all the way from elementary school through through high school. Um, you probably figured that out. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, and for uh, um, for a couple of years in high school, I, I was in jazz band in junior high school, but for my first two years in high school, um, I was in, uh, in a jazz band. And we had a gig, we played a Shriners gig um, one, uh, you know, one, one week. Um, we showed up, we kind of, you know, played our, played our set, and then we got to sit around after the, you know, after we played our set and eat, right? It happened to be a pasta feed, so it was just you know spaghetti and meatballs and salad and bread and something for dessert, right? Um, and I was sitting across the table from a guy that played Barry Sachs for us. Yeah, good guy, but you know, yeah, bit of a clown. And it was the, the funniest thing. I sat across from him and he took one of these big old long spaghetti noodles, right? And he, you know, oh, compressed one mind. side of his nose. Mm -hmm. He started, well, I'm sure my... you could watch, this is kind of predated YouTube, all right, so you forgive me, I'm sure you could find this on YouTube these days, but took one of these big long spaghetti noodles, right, and just compressed one side of his nose and then just fed it up the other side and spent the next five minutes just sniffing real hard, oh. right, right? Yeah. sniffing real hard, right, slowly feeding that pasta noodle up, all right, I wish I had the figure here without the set them. but feeding that pasta noodle up, essentially along, right, through the nasal cavity mm. until it reached the nasal pharynx, right, and keep sniffing real hard, sniffing real hard, right, and kept feeding it along until finally it had gotten down to the point where it was at the back of his throat, back in the oral pharynx. All he had to do was tip his head forward, grab that little piece of spaghetti, and then he had it here, and he had it in his mouth, and he could fly. Oh. Oh. Pretty cool, huh? <laughs> I'm not suggesting you do that. I mean, no, trust me, we're not. Cool. We not. It's all connected. Uh, kind of cool. But anyway, mm. all right. Um, yeah. So, all right. That being said, um, anyway, all right. So, food is going to pass from the oral cavity. Um, and swallowing or deglutition, as we'll talk about in lecture, is the voluntary component of that. Is when we push that food back into the back into the pharynx, and that's going to then initiate a series of muscular contractions um, along the length of the pharynx to then force that, right, to then force that uh, bolus or bite of food into the, all right, uh, essentially into the esophagus. All right, into the esophagus. Now, at different points along the way, there are uh, sphincters. 
all right? There are circular muscles that are going to regulate the passage of material, all right, from one location to another location, often from one organ to another organ. Um, so in this case, the oropharynx and the laryngopharynx, right, from the pharynx, all right, at the proximal end of the esophagus uh, is a sphincter called the upper esophageal sphincter. The upper esophageal sphincter, all right? Upper esophageal sphincter is spelled S-P-H-I-N-C-T-E-R. Upper esophageal sphincter. With relaxation of the upper esophageal sphincter, then that food, that bolus of food, is able to then pass down into the esophagus. Now, the esophagus is just a muscular tube, right? And if you go from an anterior perspective into the thoracic cavity and you generally remove most of the organ, all right, you're able to go ahead and see number four here is the esophagus. It's just a collapsible muscular tube. It has the ability to expand as it's filled with tasty cake and cheese steak and then <coughs> muscular contraction, right? Smooth muscular contraction, the length of the esophagus are gonna drive that food, all right, down to the stomach. Okay, so the esophagus all right, it, you know, has the same epithelium, all right? So again, a non, I believe I'm gonna write it three times, three times, non. You can't see it anyway, you don't have to write Yeah, I know, non. <laughs> 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 Thank you for that. <laughs> That's true, yeah, yeah. Um, Non-keratinized, stratified, squamous uh -huh. epithelium. All right, uh -huh. again, the length of the esophagus, because again, it's a muscular tube that's gonna expand to accommodate the food. Muscular contractions force that food down, right? Lots of shear stresses, right? Forces acting again across the surface. So it's a good epithelium to protect against those shear, uh, against those shear stresses. And then from the esophagus, right, that food is then going to, all right, pass into the, it's gonna pass into the stomach. Right All right, it's going to pass into I pass into the stomach. Now, there is another sphincter that relaxes to permit that bite of food, all right, passage down into the, the stomach. Um, we call it the lower esophageal sphincter. It's also sometimes called the gastroesophageal sphincter. Gastro, G-A-S-T-R-O, esophageal, E-S-O-P-H-E-A-G-E-S-O-P-H-A-G-E-A-L, -E -E okay, all right. So lower esophageal sphincter, gastroesophageal sphincter. And that allows passage down into the stomach. So the last thing that we can, uh, we're able to control within the digestive system, system is the swallow, which is, where is that located in the spine? So generally, so generally speaking, right, the last thing that you really have, um, that you really generally have control over is movement from the oral cavity into the oropharynx. Once you move it back into the oropharynx, there are skeletal muscles along the pharynx that contract to force that food to the esophagus. Um, but those generally you don't have to, those aren't generally under voluntary control, okay? Certainly by the time you, it reaches the esophagus, you have, you have no control really over, over what's occurring at all, okay? So really the last kind of um, effort you make is just to push it back into the, the pharynx. Okay. And then it moves along the esophagus, muscular contraction, right, relaxation, lower esophageal sphincter, and then whoop, Right, right into the stomach. Uh, this just is a nice, it, although it's all kind of the same color, uh, kind of shows you the wall, if you will, of the, uh, of the esophagus. Uh, you can see this is the lumen. And again, it's, it's an irregularly shaped lumen because it's essentially a collapsible tube, right? It just kind of collapses if it's not filled. And then as it fills with food, right, it expands as food is effectively moved through it and muscular contractions propel that food all right, down towards, uh, down towards the stomach. So uh, the epithelium here, all right, all that epithelium, that's your uh, non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. And that is the epithelium associated with 
all right, the digestive mucosa. Remember, mucous membranes are membranes that line, um, that line regions of the body that are gonna be exposed to the external environment. They're gonna be exposed to the external environment, all right? And the epithelium is one part of that mucosa. So in this case, right, with our, with our model here, now this is a model of the small intestine, okay? So um, some structural specializations here that aren't present, let's say, uh, in, the, uh, in the esophagus or in the stomach, for example. Uh, but nevertheless, you can still kind of go through the general layering, if you will, of the wall. Um, you know, this here, all right, reflects the epithelium of the, all right, of the mucosa. And that epithelium changes. Like I said, um, you know, in the esophagus, it's a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium from the stomach, all right, through essentially, you know, to kind of the end of the anal canal, all right, um, is a simple columnar epithelium. So stomach, small intestine, large intestine, like I said, through kind of the anal canal, all right, uh, is going to be simple columnar. All right, so that's actually kind of what you see. It's actually what you see here. But that's one part of the mucosa is the epithelium. Okay. Now, deep to the epithelium, we have kind of loose connective tissue, right? Kind of loose connective tissue proper. You have blood vessels. You may have glands. Okay. Uh, that's all found in a region called the lamina propria. All right, the lamina propria. Here, I can write small on this board too. All right, so the mucosa, oops. The mucosa consists of an epithelium, the lamina propria, which is a con connective tissue layer, uh, like I said, deep to it. And then a very thin layer of smooth muscle. Very thin layer of smooth muscle. So as you look at the as you look at the model, again you can see the epithelium here. In this, this case, it's columnar because this is small intestine, where you see all of these blood vessels, all right, and and all of this green. All of that is effectively the lamina propria, okay. And then you see this very thin pink layer right here. That thin pink layer is what's called the muscularis mucosa. It's the connective it's tissue layer, tissue. Okay. all right, that's deep to the epithelium. Thank you. Sure. So, you know, this, you know, when you think about it, if you were kind of going through the wall, if you will, of the digestive tract, right, you know, this is where you're, this is where you're thinking. tasty cake, right, in the lumen of some organ, right, and then, right, so your tasty cake would be here, and then you've got the epithelium, you've got the lamina propria, you've got the muscularis mucosa that make up what we call the mucosa, the mucous membrane, okay? Now, there's more, right, there's more than just the mucosa, right, there's additional layers, right? So beyond the mucosa, we have a region known as the submucosa. All right, easy enough. Okay. And this is in the stomach or the small intestine? Yes, both. Submucosa. All right, so we've got the mucosa. Deep to that, we have the submucosa, larger blood vessels, glands, lymphatic vessels, specialized structures, depending where you are, okay? The submucosa, all right? So you see that here, submucosa. Okay. The next layer is the layer that, where we, where we find lots of smooth muscle, all right? Lots of smooth muscle. Um, you generally find two layers of smooth muscle. And this is the region known as the muscularis externa. All right, muscularis externa. 
So this big, thick kind of pink layer right here of the muscularis externa. And there are two distinct layers of muscle. There is an outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. MM is just my lazy for muscle, not millimeter, that wouldn't make any sense. All right, and then there is an inner circular layer of smooth muscle. All right, so collectively we call it the muscularis externa. Another thing that we'll talk about when we get into uh, into lecture is um, when we get to the digestive system. You'll notice a lot of the yellow that you see here in the submucosa, or that you see even here on the uh, the muscularis externa. How do you know that these the ones that you see show that they're from deep sleep hypothermia? No. So no. I mean, so I mean, if you wanted to go, if you wanted to keep going that way, then you'd want to put inner before the outer, right? So the, the circular layer, right? The circular layer wraps around, you know, is, is closer to the tasty cake than the longitudinal layer. The longitudinal layer is gonna run the length of the organ, the circular layer obviously is gonna run the So if you wanted to arrange it that way, then you're right, inner would be up here, okay? Um, but all of the little yellow that you see here, right, all of that yellow, this is part of a nervous system called the enteric nervous system. I usually talk about it briefly in AMT, AMT1 when we get to the autonomic nervous system. I don't know if you spend any time in your AMT1 class talking about the enteric nervous system, but it's a standalone nervous system, meaning that it, it, it can operate completely independent from the brain and the spinal cord, from the central nervous system. Um, there are actually, it's actually thought that there are more neurons associated with the enteric nervous system than there are in the spinal cord. All right? Sometimes referred to as your second brain. All right? um, and this particular right, enteric nervous system is particularly important at coordinating movements along the digestive tract, right? Movements that don't necessarily require input from the central nervous system. All right, so that'll be something that I'll bring up again uh, in our conversations in, uh, in lecture. All right, but that next layer is the muscularis externa. Um, in your chair, we like to talk about like, the gut brain axis, like the communication between your gut and your brain. Mm -hmm. is, would that be considered like the enteric nervous system? So the or enteric no? nervous system would be the nervous system along the length of the digestive tract. The connection you're talking about is, you know, kind of the, you know, the additional explanation that gets provided in lecture is that while it is capable of operating independent of the brain or spinal cord, it also works in conjunction with. Okay. So the enteric nervous system is usually described as semi-autonomous because it can work by itself or like you said, in conjunction with the central nervous system. Okay. Okay. Cool. All right. So that's the muscularis externa. The last layer of the digestive wall, all right, uh, this very thin layer right here, okay, is called the serosa. Now, for the esophagus, it's a little bit different. For the esophagus, although you can't really see it, uh, you can't really see anything beyond the muscularis externa for this particular image. But because the bulk of the esophagus is found in the thoracic cavity and it's not surrounded by a serous membrane, we refer to that outer layer instead of the adventitia. Okay, uh, I need to um, split the hairs a little bit there, but. Um, you know, just appreciate that outer, that outermost layer, um, once we're down in the abdominal pelvic cavity, right, that outermost layer is called the serosa. Okay. Right. And what's the name of the, what's the name of the uh, serous membrane, membrane in the abdominal pelvic cavity? Serosa. Starts with a P and rhymes with air E. Peritoneum. Okay. So layers, if you will, of the digestive wall. Uh, there will be some histology associated with that. All right. On your uh, certainly on your your last final exam, and, and we'll talk about it some more. And I have some really good images 
uh, that we'll look at in a lecture presentation. Okay, so some of that you can see, right, you can see here the muscularis externa, all right, number two is kind of showing you the uh, submucosa, uh, that thin layer of muscle that you see here, this thin layer of muscle would be the muscularis mucosa, all right, then you can see lamina propria, and then you can see the epithelium adrenum, arytenoids, uh, parenchyma, epithelium. What did we say to submucosa? What did we say to who? It's just more connected to you. All right, so uh, anyway, we had dropped our tasty cake or our cheesesteak into the stomach, so anterior perspective again into the abdominal cavity really is, you know, at this point, uh, we can see a little bit of the lung, all right, up in the thoracic cavity, the diaphragm here at number two, liver, all right, gallbladder, um, you know, again, uh, you know, we'll talk more about those probably in, uh, in lecture, not so much today. Uh, and then this little, all right, organ right here, you know, small, not generally, not, Currently filled or distended, um, stomach has the capacity to hold several gallons worth of food. Um, so really, to expand significantly, well, maybe upwards of about a gallon or so. But you know, when it's completely collapsed and empty, and you're talking like maybe 50, 100 milliliters, all right. But it has a tremendous capacity again to um, store large volumes of undigested food. All right. Um, uh, you know, what you see here for eight, this is called the greater omentum, so folds of the peritoneum throughout the abdominal cavity, plus, all right, the yellow color, all right, uh, you know, reflects the uh, adiposity or the adipose tissue, all right, associated with, uh, you know, associated with the greater omentum. Uh, if we cut away that greater omentum, then you can see a little bit more, all right, again, here is our stomach. Now we can see the, you know, largely the small intestine coiled up throughout the abdominal cavity. Um, the large intestine is really found around the perimeter of the abdominal pelvic cavity. So we'll talk in just a moment about um, different regions of the small intestine and such. But here at number four is the start of the large intestine. The large intestine begins, uh, you know, what we call the cecum, okay? Uh, and that's where we find your appendix, your appendix, your variform appendix is found off of the cecum. So this little thing right here, number 10, all right, is the appendix. But that's the cecum, okay? Um, and then material is going to pass, again, largely around kind of the perimeter, if you will, of the uh, abdominal cavity, right? So uh, through what we call the ascending, transverse colon, the descending colon, we lose a little bit, all right, the descending colon. Um, that kind of flexure that you see there, that's what we refer to as the sigmoid colon. And then the sigmoid colon, all right, kind of drops down and is found posterior to the urinary bladder as the rectum. All right, as the rectum. Okay. Now, in terms of the stomach, and we'll get to regions of the small intestine. Okay, there we go. A little bit more small intestine, or yes, stomach. More small intestine, mesentery, right? All of the connective tissue that you see here, all right. Uh, you know, kind of connecting the different regions, if you will, of the of the small intestine. Uh, you have anywhere generally from about eight to twelve feet of small intestine. It can be longer than that in the cadaver when there's no muscle tone, all right. Um, but when there's muscle tone, you know, in uh, in a living uh, individual, typically you're looking at eight to twelve, maybe. 13, 14 feet right, of small intestine, usually somewhere around four to five feet of large intestine. Um, here's the stomach though, all right? So, you know, here's the stomach. This would be the esophagus, right? The esophagus, again, you're tasting it traveling along the esophagus. You're gonna have relaxation of that lower esophageal sphincter, all right? And that food then is gonna fall into, all right, effectively the stomach. Now, there are different regions to the stomach. Uh, the cardia is that region of the stomach that's immediately inferior to the esophagus. This portion of the stomach up here all right, is referred to as the fundus, all right, the fundus. Uh, the bulk of the stomach is referred to as the body, and then as that stomach narrows, you'll notice as we move towards now the small intestine, all right, we refer to this region as the pylorus, all right, so the pylorus begins to narrow, this is what's called the pyloric antrum. And then at the very end of that pyloric antrum, 
is another large sphincter, all right? And you'll be able to feel this in the fetal pig today. Uh, esophageal sphincter is not. I mean, you don't, you're not gonna be playing around at the proximal end of that esophagus, and even at the distal end of the esophagus, uh, you're not really gonna be able to palpate, not like you can at the stomach, all right? The sphincter that we find in the pyloric region of the stomach is called the? Pyloric sphincter, yes, absolutely. And all of the correct answer would have been, what is the pyloric sphincter? So if it's regenerative, it's regenerative. all right? So, um, and there, if we section it, all right, you can see what it looks like on the inside. So from the stomach, we're gonna go to the small intestine, right? But what's gonna regulate that passage to the small intestine, like I said, is the pyloric sphincter. And so you see these are rugae kind of, you know, folds, if you will, all right, within the stomach, again, that are going to allow it to expand. I think it's upwards of, again, upwards of about like a gallon or two. So, uh, can't spell today. Thinking very large quantity, just about a gallon. All right, all right. so rugae, it allow for significant distension, certainly, of, uh, of the stomach. And you can see as we move through the, that pyloric region here to the pyloric antrum, it narrows significantly, all right? And then right here at eight, and it'll be visible in pigs, like it was visible, all right, in cadaver as well, and you can feel it, all right, that pyloric sphincter, all right? So this is what's gonna regulate the movement of that very acidic mixture that your tasty cake and your cheese, uh, cheese steak have become, um, that's going to regulate its passage into, right, into the small intestine as it relaxes. You know, as it relaxes a little bit, and as the contents of the stomach are liquefied, then it's able to kind of squirt, if you will, all right, into, uh, into the small intestine. Um, it's a simple columnar epithelium. The other thing that I might mention about the stomach is there is an additional layer of smooth muscle within the stomach. One of the functions is to certainly, you know, store undigested food. Um, and to mechanically digest that food, right? So through uh, powerful muscular contraction, which is generally sweet, all right, from the gastroesophageal sphincter down through the stump body of the stomach, through the pylorus, toward that pyloric sphincter, um, that additional layer of smooth muscle just helps to, over a period, depending on what it is consumed, over a period of minutes to hours, helps to slowly kind of liquefy that food along with glandular secretions that again are, are discussed in, in lecture, okay? And so when it is sufficiently liquefied, right, then that food is able to pass the pyloric sphincter into the proximal portion of the small intestine, the initial portion of the small intestine. And there are three regions to the small intestine, all right? The first is called the duodenum, all right? Some people pronounce it duodenum. Potato, potato. All right, uh, the duodenum is the shortest region of the small intestine. It's this little U-shaped region that you see right here. That's the duodenum, okay? All right, and it's into the duodenum that you get secretions from the pancreas arriving via the pancreatic duct, and then bile from the gallbladder introduced into the small intestine. All right, and as we'll discuss more again in lecture, uh, pancreas, you know, you learned about it at AMT1 with respect to its um, regulation of blood glucose concentration, right? Alpha cells, beta cells, right? Glucagon and insulin. 99% um, of the function of the pancreas is digestion, all right? It's digestion. It produces buffers. It produces enzymes, all right? It helps buffer the acidic, material called chyme, help buffer that acidic chyme as it arrives in the small intestine, and then with the introduction of additional enzymes, helps to facilitate, all right, additional, uh, you know, kind of breakdown of nutrients, okay, so that you can absorb them along the small intestine. All right, so you can go ahead and see that common bile duct there, okay? So, um, like here in your stomach area, there's like that acid, like, I heard, like, some gastric could be, like, battery acid, like, that's how our tongue can be. Is that, that why it's, like, a little bit thicker, so it can hold that acid? And I guess, are you, like, with the food combined no, with the acid, or are you... There are, no, it doesn't have to be thicker to hold, you know, to hold the acid, per se. 
Um, there are there are specializations that we'll discuss again in lecture that allow the stomach to effectively pr protect itself from its own acidic secretion, right? The purpose of the acid, really, or the, the acidic nature of those secretions is to denaturoprotein. Right, you learned in AMP2, you know, that pH, significant changes in pH can affect the structure of protein, right? Can cause protein to denature. Um, we kind of initiate the digestion of carbohydrate and lipids in the oral cavity, but really nothing happens to protein from a digestive standpoint until it reaches the stomach because we need the acid in the stomach, right? That kind of acidic gastric juice in the stomach to denature the protein so that enzymes can then begin to target specific peptides. So yeah, the thickness isn't necessarily to protect, if you will, uh, from the, the nature of the secretion. Uh, the stomach has its own ways to kind of protect itself from, from those secretions and to, you know, reduce the likelihood that that acidic, uh, you know, kind of gastric juices, you know, uh, to help prevent it from escaping, if you will, from the stomach. And it has no valves, so that's why you can throw up, right? Or no valves well, the body. you have sphincters, right? You still have the lower and the upper esophageal sphincters, right? That regulate the passage through the esophagus. So clearly those are gonna relax as part of vomiting reflex, all right? Okay. Okay, to allow, to allow uh, material to be forcefully expelled, uh, expelled backward. Okay. Um, histology of the stomach, don't worry about it. We'll talk more and not even, I've got better figures than this. Um, yeah, this is okay. Yeah. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the histology of the stomach and we'll look at the stomach here in lab in the coming weeks uh, with the microscopes and you know, slide books and such. Uh, but the gastric mucosa is what we typically focus on in the stomach because it's within the gastric mucosa that we find gastric pits. Gastric pits, all right, so these little depressions that you see up here are called gastric pits. Um, and those are lined generally by, again, columnar cells uh, that produce copious amounts of um, Um, you know, they, they produce copious amounts of uh, mucus, okay? And then deep to those gastric pits down here, right, the area uh, that you see here, three, is where we find what are called gastric glands. And here we have a number of specialized cells, um, you know, chief cells, parietal cells, all right, uh, enteroendocrine cells like G cells and such <laughs> that produce, bless you, that produce, you know, hormones, produce, all right, hydrochloric acid, produce uh, an enzyme called um, pepsin in its inactive form, which is pepsin. Um, all right, and all of that is kind of part of the production of gastric juice. All right, we generally produce a couple liters of gastric juice uh, daily as well. You know, a couple of liters of saliva, a couple of liters of gastric juice, pancreas produces some gastric, uh, some pancreatic juice, a whole bunch of different kind of juices that you're not gonna find in your local grocery. You produce daily, all right? Um, and so, like I said, then that material is gonna move into the small intestine. The first kind of short region of the small intestine is the duodenum. This is a nice slide. It's in your PowerPoint presentation. It's one that has appeared before on the, like a lot final exam, I'm just saying. Um, it shows you nicely at least three of those four regions of the digestive wall that I mentioned. You can see very clearly the mucosa, right? So you see a very, very thin layer of pink, just kind of deep to the purple here. That thin layer of pink would be the muscularis mucosa, right? Everything, all right, on up to kind of, you know, the tips of what are called intestinal villi. All of that is the mucosa, the intestinal mucosa. You know, the epithelium is gonna be a simple columnar epithelium. There's even a little bit of tasty cake and cheesecake in there already. All right, the lamina propria is this kind of purple, right, kind of the purple stuff. And then again, that very thin pink layer is the muscularis, muscularis mucosa. Deep to that, in this region here, three, that's the submucosa, all right, submucosa. Uh, in the duodenum, there's uh, specialized glands in the submucosa that are called Bruner's glands. Produce copious amounts of mucus, again, that very acidic material in the stomach is going to arrive into the duodenum, right? So the duodenum needs to be able to protect itself from that highly acidic material. Again, we call it chyme. Um, that highly acidic chyme, and so these Bruner's glands within the submucosa, all right, produce copious amounts of mucus to protect the intestinal mucosa, all right, from that uh, acidic material. And then down here at four, you see the muscularis externum. 
So inner circular, I outer longitudinal.